Okay, thank you. Um, so, comfort or not to comfort, that's the topic. So, if you look at uh, these people, Aborigines in Australia, they're really uh, facing a harsh environment in the desert in Australia. It's very hot at daytime, but uh, maybe you don't know, but very cool at night, almost freezing. And they're sleeping outside, nude. And uh, Schulander in the 50s did research on these people and compared them with uh, uh, westernized people as controls. And what he saw is that these people slept very well, naked in the cold at night, while the controls were shivering all night and couldn't sleep at all. So somehow they were adapted to that environment and because of their continuous uh, exposure to these harsh environments, they could cope with that and also affecting their energy metabolism. Unfortunately, nowadays we cannot measure them again because nowadays they're all obese and uh, you, they're not leaving, living like this anymore. We still sit in circles around with each other, but there's something changed with us. Of course, we eat more. Of course, we have less physical activity than the Aborigines did. And, um, and we changed our environment. And that's, of course, the point I want to make here. We focus very much on our health, on food and exercise, but I think the environment counts as well. So here you see what happens in the past years with our uh, health. Uh, you see gradually a huge increase, and these are data from the United States, of uh, uh, obesity. But interestingly, parallel to that, some other very serious diseases and syndromes increased as well. Like we see here in the lower graphs, you see here uh, a huge increase in diabetes type 2 as well. So it's really a serious uh, health problem. And this is not only for the States, I got these from uh, the internet, but it's as severe in Europe. And it's now in the Netherlands, one million people have type 2 diabetes. It's really amazing amounts. So there's really we need to do something about that. And of course, everybody says we should look at our food and eat less. And of course, that is important. And it affects our energy balance, the body energy balance. And that affects our body weight and our health. <clears throat> but on the other hand, you can also increase your energy expenditure. But you have to do a lot of exercise to influence your body weight. Anyway, it's very healthy to exercise. Also, exercise is known to improve the type 2 diabetes and to be able to cope with the lots of sugar in your food, etc. But the point I want to make that apart from that, we also have to look at our indoor environment. And we can do something about that by sometimes being outside our thermal comfort uh, zone and our thermal neutral zone. And that is the point I want to make. So I would like to talk with you, briefly tell something about the current models and how we look at it. Uh, then the main part of my talk is about heat and cold acclimation. And I will touch upon interaction with other senses like light and some of the implications for modeling. So this is in fact the core of my talk. Comfort and health. Are they conflicting? conflicting? Well, in the past it wasn't. During times of evolution, this wasn't really com conflicting. The comfort was very important because comfortable conditions satisfied the optimal human condition. Like, for instance, energy savings. So if you were quiet, if you were lazy, and you still got enough food, you were better off than your neighbor that was running around and not getting any food. So being, yeah, uh, have, have, being, uh, having energy savings is an advantage in natural environments. And being comfortable, therefore, is important and drives the human thermal behavior. Please don't do too much, be comfortable. On the other hand, in a modern society, it's completely different than health is in, in, in another aspect. And we have seen we get these obesity problems. So here we might say we need some discomfort. And if you get some discomfort, being cold, being in the heat, may increase your resilience to uncomfortable conditions, like extreme cold, for instance, and increase your energy metabolism, as I will show you. So the point I want to make <clears throat> is this, yes, we have to take care about the food, but it doesn't mean we cannot have a nice evening meal. Of course you can. The point I want to make, yes, we should do a lot of physical activity, but we're still allowed to sit in a chair sometimes. Why not? 
And I'm also making a point that yes, of course, comfort our environment is okay, but let's be uh, let's take into account that we need some excursions to cold and heat as well in order to be healthy. <clears throat> so this, of course, you know, I can be very brief with this. This is the conventional model developed by Fanga, very good at the time, but with the new insights, maybe we need some adaptations because it is a limited inclusion of human physiology and we know much more nowadays because it's limited validity for an individual level and it's mainly valid in steady state conditions. So I really think we have to rethink our modeling uh, uh, because this has really led to a very tightly controlled indoor environmental temperatures and we all know that that is not what we now seek for. Especially by the work of Humphreys and later the deer, we have the adaptive comfort model that shows us <coughs> that we are much more flexible if we have our own control, if we're used to the differences in outdoor temperature and exposed to it, we accept indoor a much wider range of environmental temperatures and as I will show you, also meet temperatures that are really, let's say, uh, also affecting our body and training our body and uh, maybe in more healthy conditions. So I suggest, one of the suggestions I do is let's include these health aspects in the coming years into our models. <clears throat> and health, with that I mean uh, things like energy metabolism, glucose and lipid metabolism, cardiovascular uh, related diseases. But also just simple things, if you are exposed regularly to cold, you're better resilient against cold, so winter and summer mortality and aging can be affected. By, uh, by these exposures to other temperatures than we nowadays are in our indoor environment. So we should include some of physiology, take care of the individual variation, especially the body composition is an important aspect, and have a special focus on a specific group like the obese and the elderly and females. Okay, a few words about thermal regulation because it's important for the model that we use in thermal physiology. <clears throat> we have to defend our core temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. So in order to do that, and because we have always, in energy metabolism, produced heat, we have to get rid of the heat. And in a cold environment, you have to be a little bit conservative to maintain the 37 degrees Celsius. So then we have vasoconstriction and not too much blood to the skin and be, uh, not too much heat loss. But in a warm environment, we want to get rid of the extra heat and then we have lots of perfusion to the skin. So the skin is heated up and uh, we can uh, have heat exchange with the environment. By doing our thermal regulation in this way, that's very cheap, doesn't cost extra energy. So that is what we call the thermal neutral zone, the zone in which we regulate our energy, uh, our thermal uh, temperature by skin and uh, perfusion, by blood perfusion. <clears throat> this is indicated in the green area here, and it's around 30 degrees Celsius. That is rather high, but this is for a nude uh, uh, human. So that is 30 degrees and a, a little bit around that. So that is our thermal neutral zone, and within that thermal neutral zone, somewhere lies our comfort zone. <clears throat> If you go to higher temperatures and lower temperatures, then you increase your energy expenditure. And this is where I first want to focus on the increase in energy expenditure in the cold environment. The point I want to make here is that you increase your energy expenditure, you of course start shivering, you know that. But we found out in the last 10 years that also there's a huge non-shivering component, which is really relevant and, uh, and substantial. And Shivering, of course, is very uncomfortable, uh, you, it's fatiguing, so it's not something you want to have in the built environment, I think. But the non-shivering thermogenesis, you're not even aware of it. You increase your heat production, you use your body reserves to produce heat, so it can be a healthy situation, um, but you're not even aware, maybe you're feeling a little bit cold, but certainly you're not shivering. 
So it is this what we were focusing on. And we do these uh, measurements in the chambers in Maastricht. We have five climate chambers where we can measure oxygen consumption of the volunteers and the patients. And we can uh, do all kinds of measurements <coughs> like uh, thermometry, wireless, and we do skin blood flow measurements, etc. So um, uh, one of the first experiments we did was in a cold environment where after sometimes, here you see the movement of the muscles, you get muscle contraction, so shivering. So energy expenditure, heat production goes up with the shivering, that's logic. But what we saw, there was also a part that increased energy expenditure before shivering occurred. And that's what we call the non-shivering thermogenesis. And um, yes, we got very interested in that and did some more experiments. And this is a three hour mild cold exposure. That means without shivering. And you see that a group indeed from thermoneutral to mild cold increased the energy expenditure, just as we expect. But the most interesting part is this lower graph. You see there is a huge individual variation in the non-shivering thermogenesis. So in response to the cold, some people, like this subject number 20, increases up to 30% in the energy expenditure. It's a huge amount. One third extra energy expenditure without shivering, just in a cool environment. While others have much lower values or sometimes even drop. So there's a very interesting individual variation. That's something that we kept always in mind in the coming experiments that we did after this one. <coughs> So which tissue is responsible for this? And first we were a bit puzzled because it was a kind of uh, dogma that adults don't have brown fat. Brown fat, you say, what's that? Well, brown fat is known from hibernators. They need it. It's a stove to warm up after the hibernation in wintertime, in spring. And then uh, small mammals also have it because they cool down so easy, because they're so small. They need a stove. They need to heat up. And babies. In textbooks, it was in babies as well, but only in babies, we thought at that time. And um, here you see the difference. White fat, we all know it's making us fat. There's a lot of, every cell is a little bit obese, as you can see, you're filled with fat. While the brown fat has mitochondria much more, and these mitochondria there, the heat production takes place. Just the goal is heat production. <clears throat> so if in the cold, it's turned on and the baby is safe. And we found out, uh, together with the uh, Department of Nuclear Medicine, and together with the imaging techniques where we follow glucose, sugar, which tissue uses sugar in our body, in the cold. And we found out that brown fat does. Here you see the black areas, supraclavicular, this behind here, the sleutelbenen. Uh, and then we see uh, in the neck region and along the spines, there is the spots where there is brown fat. So very interestingly, if we take the same subject, healthy volunteers, thermoneutral condition, no brown fat at all activated, you bring him to mild cold, no shivering, huge amount of brown fat here in black indicated with the scanning technique, glucose uptake, metabolic active, a stove heating up the body. And with the same series of measurements, we found out that is inversely related, the amount of brown fat with the amount of body fat, meaning that in lean subjects, although there's a huge variation, but lean subjects generally have a lot of brown fat, while obese subjects do not, or hardly any. Here's some, here's a morbidly obese subject, no brown fat at all. So in summary, yes, adults have brown fat, uh, the activity is related to uh, the thermogenesis, to the energy expenditure, the heat production in the cold. And interestingly, brown fat is blunted or absent compared to young lean subjects in obese, in elderly, I didn't show you, and also reduced in type 2 diabetes. From animal studies, it's well known that brown fat has many health implications, not only for the energy balance, but also for glucose, metabolism, etc. So it's interesting to find out whether in these subjects we can increase the energy expenditure, increase uh, uh, brown fat. So that was the next thing. Can we indeed, by playing with the temperature, increase uh, this situation. And here you see the cells, there's white and brown, and it's a mixture. So in principle, there's room for increase of this brown fat tissue. 
And the first experiment we did was uh, Anouk van der Lans, PhD students at our lab, did an experiment in nine females and nine males. We used a 10-day cold exposure, six hours per day, and we used 14 to 15 degrees Celsius. That's a bit chilly. So uh, some were shivering, but after 10 days, the shivering diminished, was getting less and less. So you got some acclimation only by shivering, you got an indication of that. <clears throat> and here you see, I jump immediately to the main result. Uh, you here see one subject before, in testing during cold exposure in the scanner, we see some uh, brown fat uh, here. And afterwards, you see this, oh, the same uh, subject, uh, almost doubling of the amount of brown fat. So only a 10-day cold acclimation already increases the amount of brown fat that much. So we see, after 10-day cold exposure, an increase in this heat production in the cold, the non-shivering thermogenesis, significantly so. We see also an increase in brown fat. These two were related to each other again. And there was no gender differences. Females, males, same response. So now we know that from lean subjects, and the next thing we ask ourselves, does this also account for type 2 diabetes, because that's such an, a more important disease to get some better uh, treatment uh, opportunities. And can the indoor environment play a role in the development of type 2 diabetes? <clears throat> so Mark Hansen, another PhD student at our lab, did the experiment in eight male subjects with a 10-day cold exposure. It's the same protocol, six hours per day, 14 to 15 degrees Celsius exposure every day. And we did the brown fat study, but the brown fat was a little disappointing. We got an increase in brown fat, but still very low. We got an increase in energy expenditure, but not too much. But because we were working with the type 2 diabetes patients, uh, we decided also to measure with a hyperinsulinic use glycemic clamp. And since nobody knows what that means, uh, this is a measure uh, we use for insulin sensitivity. So how sensitive are we to insulin? This is the hormone that regulates our blood glucose, our blood sugars. So how well can we uh, 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 cope with insulin in our blood? So this is a very important measure. And I just show you the results of that measurements because they were quite uh, dramatic. You see that the cold acclimation in type 2 diabetes led to an increase in insulin sensitivity of more than 40%, which is equal or higher than the best known uh, treatment at the moment, that is exercise combined with food. So we see that in every subject, insulin sensitivity increased. This is the measure for that. Don't worry about the units. I can explain you later. But you see there's an average an increase of more than 40%, which is really tremendous. And we just got it accepted in Nature Medicine, of which we are very happy, of course. So then we thought, if brown fat cannot be the cue, it does increase brown fat, but not that much. We started searching which tissue is involved here. And just for your interest, I show you this picture that shows here of three subjects the cells. So it's a micro slides, microscopic slide of the cells. And you see the membranes of the cells. And you see hardly any coloration here, which means that uh, the color here indicates the receptor that takes in the glucose into the blood cells. But after the cold acclimation, you see there's everywhere on the cell membrane are these receptors active, taking in the blood glucose into the cell and thereby improving glucose handling of the body. And so I think it's very important that we find both two aspects of cold acclimation, increase in energy expenditure in many subjects, an increase in brown fat and in type 2 diabetes, an increase in glucose handling. <clears throat> Both of these experiments on cold acclimation also showed that the thermal comfort increased. So before, people were really uncomfortable when they first, in the first day of the 10 day, were exposed to the cold, to the 15 degrees. No surprise, they were uncomfortable. But after only 10 days, they already were just comfortable. So in general, 
cold acclimation, increased brown adipose tissue and energy expenditure in healthy, lean young subjects, and also significantly increased insulin sensitivity, together with an increase in thermal comfort. And now I will just briefly tell you something about our ongoing experiments. We were very much focused on the cold, but I thought, well, maybe the heat is also interesting to have a look at that. And Hanna Palerwinski is doing experiments now on uh, thermoregulatory behavior and physiology during, uh, uh, before and after heat acclimation. <clears throat> so it's really a mild heat acclimation, and I will tell you something about the thermoneutral zone and the very first results we got so far. And we used the protocol that was developed by Lishi Scheller, who is unfortunately not here, but at least uh, you can see her here. And, um, well, what she uses uh, is two protocols. One is a ramp upwards and a ramp downwards. And if we combine the measurements during these temperature ramps, uh, we get these results. And this is subject just an example to show you that we're working on it and that there's, again, a lot of individual variation. One subject here, 30 degrees Celsius, again, included. And you see there's in the heat and in the cold an increase in energy expenditure. While another subject has a way, the same shape, but it's much wider. You see that the thermal neutral zone is much wider. So this indicates that there's also in this aspect, in the thermal neutral zone positioning and width, there's a significant individual variation. So this protocol is used by Hanna Palubinski to study the heat acclimation. And this is again just one example. We are working our way to the 22 subjects and then we can be much more definite about the result. But so far we see that this subject, before and after, it's a very nice thermal neutral zone indication. It's the first time these things are mapped in humans. And um, what you see is that before and after is almost identical in this subject. But what we also see on the right side, we have here the comfortable uh, ratings. We see that before they were just uncomfortable and afterwards comfortable. So there's a shift. It looks like there gets a shift in the comfort zone. So, um, yeah, to, sum to summarize this, we see that, um, yes, the comfort zone is somewhere in the thermal neutral zone, but with the cold acclimation, we see a shift towards the cooler environment, increasing our energy expenditure, increasing in brown fat, and still being relatively comfor comfortable. And we see with heat acclimation, probably we will find the same results as well. Just to touch upon this aspect, we always focus on the temperature if we look at thermal comfort, but it can be influenced by light as well. There are small, some indication that it can, and uh, Marije de Kulver uh, works on this, how this affects our thermal comfort as well. So if you are interested, please go to the poster of Marije. She got some in, uh, indications already that light indeed affects human energy expenditure with this, under the same temperature conditions. Uh, sorry, uh, it affects human energy expansion. Yes, but the same thermal conditions, but with differences in light. But please visit the poster. The final thing I would like to mention, because there's not much time to go into detail on the models, but uh, one thing is important with modeling to take the skin temperature into account. Because here you see an example of an obese subject and a normal weight subject. There's a huge variation, difference in skin temperature distribution. And here you see the obese have the body temperature. The corpus is really lower compared to the normal weight. <laughs> and that has to do with the tissue insulation. So body composition really matters if you want to model uh, and that is what Boris Kingma will tell to, to you tomorrow during an oral presentation, how we use our model of the thermal neutral zone, but include skin temperature as well, not only the environmental temperature, but we really need data on skin temperature and data on body composition and tissue insulation as well, and then we can say more about the comfort zone. So, to sum up, Marcel, I think I'm in time. I hope you still understood it. Um, but uh, the future for the thermal comfort models, well, I'm not with everything I don't know, of course. 
I don't know everything, but I know health is very important. So we should include body uh, physiology and especially body composition. Take the individual differences into account and include a dynamic indoor environment, or at least think about that. Because if you use a dynamic environment, people accept the excursions outside the thermal neutral zone much more easy. Um, that is also studies by Lesje Schelle have shown that. So maybe not, we shouldn't talk about optimal comfort, but we should talk about optimal comfort and maybe not maximal comfort. Um, okay, so a healthy thermal environment, uh, that means that we exercise our thermal regulatory system as part of a healthy lifestyle. And by regular exposure outside the thermal neutral zone, we increase our energy expenditure, brown adipose tissue, insulin sensitivity, and, very important, increase the resilience to more extreme weather conditions. And this is very important related to healthy aging, I think. So we, let's talk about temperature training and to keep that in mind when we design our indoor climate. We can allow the temperatures to drift, and that also can contribute to a sustainable built environment with less fuel, less energy consumption. I'm not going to say that we don't need diet and physical activity anymore, but lifestyle programs really should include a healthy environment. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention.